So this is the second lecture. Uh, and uh, I want to start with a little reminding of what we are going to do. So uh, the main goal was to study a model space, the character variety, model space of local systems on surfaces. But in order to achieve this, we are, uh, proceed to a different space, which has much more structures, which allow in particular to go back, but also allow uh, to treat the model space of local systems the way we want. And so let me just remind you, uh, actually define this model space. We denoted P depends on the group G and on the decorated surface S. So first of all, uh, here is the reminder what is a decorated surface. So it's a surface, first of all. Uh, it has holes. Uh, and it also has punctures. So it's arbitrary surface with punctures. And it also has holes. And by default, each uh, hole have at least one special point. So this red points are special points. Everything modular isotopy. Now, uh, mm, we defined last time uh, two important uh, varieties which we need. So first of all, there was a flag variety B. And secondly, it was a principal affine space A, which I remind you is just modular space of pairs U and Psi, uh, where U is maximal unipotent and uh, Psi is a character of U. Uh, which is a non-degenerate character. And so this space is isomorphic to G mod U, where U is a maximal unipotent subgroup. Now, there is a uh, very important for us map, uh, H, which goes from the configuration space of pairs uh, of a fine flex, which is by definition just A cross A divided by the diagonal action of G to Cartan group. Uh, so we say that it assigns to a pair of affine or decorated flags this H invariant, which lives here. And its definition is clear uh, from the broad decomposition, because if you write A cross A divided by G as just a double mm, cosets using the fact that A is G mod U, then this is just G mod U mod U. And by Briard decomposition, this is just U times some element of the Cartan group times, and that's a little non trivial fact. It's a lift, a natural lift uh, of the Vale group element to the group G times U. And so this is this H. Now, it's important to me that it's a completely canonical map. And I remind you that the G is a joint group. And so if G adjoint means has trivial center, then this H is symmetric. H of A1, A2 equals H of A2, A1. All right. So uh, if um, you mean, it, is it by rational map only to find where the, hmm? this W we have here should be? I did not say how I lift uh, the element of the Vale group to, to the group G. So I need to, to talk about uh, uh, data of root system and so on. So far in order to do this. But I mean, which, but I mean, a priori you could have different W period. Yes. So I use this one. So, <coughs> and it, it's symmetric. So you will see example for, for PGL2. Well, you will see how all this works. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let me give you a definition, which is a kind of a non-standard definition. Ah. The word is standard, the definition is non-standard. Uh, I say that a pinning uh, is the following data, is a generic pair uh, of decorated flags, A1 and A2. Generic means that uh, this pair and the decomposition corresponds to a maximal length element W0 in the Vale group. So it's a generic pair uh, mm, such that the H distance between two uh, 
elements the studio created flex is one. As I said, usually pinning is defined in a different way, and this becomes a property, but I prefer to have it this way. And then we'll say that this is, uh, so <coughs> to remind you that we have a natural projection. Configuration of two degraded flags goes to configurations of two flags. This is canonical projection pi. And we say in this case that, that uh, so this is H bundle. And we say a pinning uh, A1, A2 over a uh, pair of flex B1, B2, where B1, B2 is a pair of flex which obtained from A1, A2 by this projection. So that, that's the language we use. OK, now we can go to the key definition. And I'll give you an example later on right after. So key definition that the modulus space we're looking for, the modulus space uh, PGS uh, parameterizes triples Uh, so uh, these triples are denoted by L, beta, and P pinning, where, uh, first of all, L is a G-local system. On the underlying topological surface S, so B, beta, sorry, is called a framing. And so this is a flat section uh, of the associate local system of flags. Uh, mm, so this associated local system flex, we denote that LB, <coughs> you can just say that this is L cross B over G, or this is the same thing as L divided by action of somebody else's group. So it's a, it's a flat section of this guy near each marked point. I remind you that the marked points are these blue and red points, the punctures and special points on the boundary. And so what this definition says is that we have to basically take a flag near each of them. And if this is a puncture, this is just a flag which is invariant under the monodromy around the flag. Now the third part of this definition tells you what is P. Oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you a little condition. So this will be fine as is, but uh, actually I want to put one more condition, such that for any boundary interval, what is boundary interval? Boundary interval uh, is a piece of the boundary which you see between two special points. So you have a data like that. And then uh, you have a surface here. So uh, by the uh, the date of the framing means that you have a flag here and a flag here near each of the two sp special points. And this is our boundary interval, I. And so uh, the condition is that the pair B1, B2 is generic. Uh, what does it mean that a pair of flags in different points is generic? This means that the connected by a unique interval, and so we can use the local system data to pull them to the same point, and there they become generic. So it doesn't matter to which point to move them. Now, finally, the third condition 
is a uh, so so far uh, this definition is exactly the one which we used with uh, Volodifok for for a long time. But now comes a little new thing. So we need this pinning. Uh, a1, A2, uh, over this pair B1, B2, which you see on the right, uh, for each uh, boundary interval. OK, so now how the story looks like on the picture. So we have uh, flex here, but also uh, in addition to those flex, we have those spinnings now. So it looks something like that. And you also have pinnings here. And now when I say we have a pinning, uh, this means, let me just give one example, that we have here a pair of uh, degraded flags over this pair, and we also have a pair of degraded flags over this pair considered on this segment. So this means that near each uh, special point we actually have nearby two degraded flags. So this is the data. Okay, so <coughs> let me actually make a cartoon of this data in the simplest possible non-trivial example. So let's suppose that S is just a disk which has a single puncher and two special points. So it has a puncher here and it has two special points. And so if you want to make <coughs> the correspond all the data, first of all you have to say this is okay, this is point S2, this is point S1, this is puncher P. Now you want to draw it in a bigger format. And so, OK, this is still a puncher P. There's still two points. But now mm, the data we have is the following one. So here we have flag B1. Here we have flag B2. This is the decorations sitting over those points. But also nearby we have two flags. So let's call them. Uh, a1 minus, and this is A2 minus, uh, sorry, A1 plus, beg your pardon. And here we also have another two degraded flags. Oh. <coughs> so this is uh, A2 minus, and this is A2 plus. And uh, here we also have invariant flag, so this is some other invariant flag B. That's all the data, but uh, when we say pinning, I emphasize that we mean we have a pair of decorated flags assigned to this boundary interval and to this boundary interval. Okay? All right. So that's the main definition. Now, uh, what's good about this? So before we go to discussion what's good about this, let's talk about pinnings. So that's a claim example. So let's suppose that the group G is a group PGLM. Uh, then I claim that a pinning is the same thing as uh, a projective basis in, the vec in a vector space in m-dimensional vector space, uh, which means that we're talking about a basis E1 zone so EM, uh, a basis, a modulo equivalence relation that basis E1 and so on EM, by definition, is equivalent to basis lambda E1 and so on 
lambda e m. And so on the picture, this is just, for, so for PGL2, for example, this is just two lines. Uh, I mean, it produced you two lines, but actually, you have to. Mm, okay. So you have to make a bonus here. Mm. Now, you can, you can say this in a different way. So this is two lines, but you also have to pick pair of factors in these two lines and consider them up to a scalar. So this looks a little inconvenient. And so you can say that this is the same thing as uh, a collection of m lines. Uh, let me just put it this way. m plus 1 uh, generic lines, which I uh, call the line P, the pinning line, and the lines L1 and so on Lm, which is the one which corresponds to original basis, so to speak. And so on this picture, this is the line L1, this is the line L2, and this is the line P. And you see how it works. So the line P defines your isomorphism between these two lines. And so it exactly defines your pair of a basis up to a scalar. So you can think about pinning this way. Now, why is these two definitions so equivalent? So let's call this definition star, and this is definition two stars. So the first definition is equivalent to the second for the following observation that you can always. Uh, pick uh, m plus 1 vectors in such a way that the sum is 0. So in this case, this means that we put here e1, e2, and this is e3, such that the sum is 0. This is, uh, here we're going from uh, 2 to 1. So if you have data 2, they can, then we can pick these guys and then take out of this the basis e1 and so on em, the first m of them. And vice versa, it's also clear that if you have a collection of vectors, m of them, they, they just their sum produces the line. Yeah, plus one corresponding to p. Yes, yes. So p is spent by em plus one. Okay. Now let's do even more specific example. Let's see what's been going on for PGL two. Mm -hmm. And so before we discuss PGL two, it's actually uh, a good question. So what is the principle of fine space for PGL2? Let's first of all uh, consider the case of GL2. And so the principle of fine space for GL2 uh, is given by pairs of vector and two form where V is a vector in two dimensional space, minus zero, and uh, omega is an area form also not zero. And uh, V2 is a two-dimensional space. So this is the principle of fine space for PGL2, just vector in a form. Now, uh, there is an action of the group GM, the multiplicative group, uh, which acts by taking V and omega to TV and T minus 2 omega. And so if you take the quotient, that's A PGL2, so the quotient of a GL2 model of this action. So we denote the elements, the cosets, by notation VW in this kind of parenthesis. Okay, now the question is, where is the map? So I promised you that there is a map, mm, H. Is this a PGL2 just the same as? V2 minus 0? No. So that's so if you consider uh, in a sense we don't know what v, v2 is because we mod out by the diagonal group. So for example, we mod out by element minus 1 minus 1. So as soon as you take a vector, you're bound to consider my negative of that vector. So let me explain so what uh, Joel so Joel asks a subtle question, and so what he asks, he says, let me just, 
and now, you, now you see the point, and you see the point of that discussion. Okay, so what Joel says, he says that what is principle of fine space for SL2? And this is, of course, V2 minus 0. Now, how to define this function h here? It just takes two vectors. And, okay, I said V2 minus 0. Uh, maybe we, we fix here some volume form because we want to, to talk about the group which preserves uh, the volume form. Still, you can take this volume form and evaluate on vectors V1, V2. That's all good, that's right, but it's actually non-symmetric. So if, we, if you change the sign, you get minus of that. That's, that's, this definition does not have a property of symmetry. If you want to get the definition of PGL2, you're kind of trying to say that you want to take V2 modulo plus minus 1. But the way to do it is this. Then you don't get confused. For example, how you define uh, this map H? So if you look at this definition, so what would be your map H? Joel. <laughs> I'll tell you. So if take V1 and W1, comma V2 and W2, then uh, you map them to the following number. So this is the only number you can imagine. So you take V1 of pair of vectors, W1 of V1, V2, multiplied by W2 of V1, V2. And so this map is obviously symmetric and obviously a descent to the quotient by the action GM, by exactly this kind of action of GM I discussed. So as you see, there's a little subtle thing here. And from this picture, you see that it does not depend on anything. It's, con it's absolutely canonical map, in spite of the fact that we have to use some choice of a lift of the well group element. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, we get absolutely canonical map. And symmetric. Hmm? Sorry, Sasha, above here you explain why you get two more you explain why those star and star double, double star are the same, but why are they equivalent to the original definition of pin? Uh, why is they equivalent to original definitions? This is a good exercise, uh, of course, uh, to ask the audience. But basically, you take uh, you cook up. So you take E1, E2, and so on, AM, and uh, you make a flag out of this, E1, E1 plus E2, and so on. And you make the volume form, E1, which, and so on, which, yeah. So this is how it goes. <coughs> Now, the original definition, so you take E1, then you take a uh, flag, uh, you have, okay, you can put it E1, E2, and so on. Uh, so what you need to do, you need to produce two flags, first of all, and these two flags like E1, E1, E2, and so on. And you also can read it backwards like EM, EM minus 1, EM and so on. But you also need to produce uh, a, 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 some volume form. And the volume form is dual to just which product of those guys. Uh, and uh, this is the usual flex. To get the fine flex, you just put wedge between them. Okay? And so I claim this is, a, this is the isomorphism. OK. So uh, all right. Now, why do we want to have this modular space? So the key point is that there is a gluing map. This is the absolutely key property of these modular spaces. Let me actually go first here. Uh, this modular space it's, it's has several crucial properties. The first of them, of course, is this gluing map, which, you, which I'm going to define. And the second one, as you'll see, is that this modular space is, cause allows you to localize the very notion of a local system. OK, so the gluing map. So let's suppose that uh, we're given um, uh, two boundary intervals, let's call them I1 uh, and I2 on S. And so it looks like this. So we have a surface. And we have either different surface or maybe the same surface. So I said on the same S, but this S could be disjoint. Then you just have 
uh, two different surfaces and two boundary maps. Or it could be the same surface and you just glue two boundary intervals together. So we have those boundary intervals. And then, of course, we can glue them on the surface. So we get now the glued surface, which looks like that. That's a trivial operation. Now, the claim mm, is that we can do this with the modular spaces. This is the property which the usual modular spaces of local system do not have and modular spaces which we considered all before also doesn't have. But this one does. Claim there exists canonical dominant. Dominant means onto. There is onto. A gluing map. So let's call it gamma. So related to the gluing of these two boundary intervals, which takes modal space related to the original surface and goes to modal space of whom? So I glue here the surface and I get a new surface which I want to denote by S. So if S prime, sorry, if this was S, this is S prime. And so we go to this PGS prime. And it has the following property that first of all, it's a principal H bundle over the image. It's not map onto. It's only the risky onto. Uh, and also, mm, the image dense, as I said, the dominant map. OK, so how the construction goes? The main observation for this construction is that if you consider, so construction, If you consider the collection of all pinnings, then this is a principal homogeneous G set. And so if you have any two pinnings, there is only one way to match them. There is a unique element of the group which matches them. And also, if G is a joint, I remind you this, then if you have a pinning P, which is given by far of the created flex A1, A2, then you can create the reverse pinning given by A2 and 1. And as we discussed for a joint group, this is still a pinning. For SL2 or not a joint group, this is not going to be a pinning, but in this case it is. And so now we do the gluing map. So we still have pair of surfaces to glue. So let's draw them again. But now we have the pinnings here. And so this is my pinning P, and this is a pinning Q. And so it's my surfaces. So we go from here, first of all, to the same kind of picture, but where we reversed one of the pinnings. Because originally, OK, so we just make them going sort of parallel, so it's P and Q prime, Q star. And then we just glue them. So we reverse Q. And then most importantly, we glue. And so we get a local system over this guy. So uh, how we get this local system? So we impose conditions that Pu equals Q star. And then if you had a local system sitting here, and a local system he sitting here near uh, neighborhoods of the I1 and A2. There is one and only one way to identify these two local systems here because of the pinnings. So the pinnings allow you to glue. And after you glue, you inherit all the data you had. And in particular, uh, you, you are going to inherit here some flags because uh, when you glue, you take this flag, for example, B1 prime, B2 prime, and B2 prime, B2 double prime. When you glue, I identify them. So you have a well-defined flag on the glued surface. OK, so you can glue. Now, the immediate corollary of this is 
is that the modular space PGS is rational. Because remember, uh, the main, the, there were two main problems we had to fight when we, when we wanted to quantize uh, local system on surfaces. And the first, uh, the measure was the one that it's not a rational space in general. And so we cannot hope uh, at all to introduce coordinates. But this one is rational, and it's obviously rational. So the proof goes as follows. If you consider this model space on the triangle PGT, then it's easy to check that's by rational to uh, configuration space of three flags and product in a natural way of three Cartan groups. And so now, uh, when you do this process of gluing, so if you had your original surface, you cut it on triangles like that. And you keep going. And then uh, you have this thinning data everywhere. But what happens uh, when you glue, uh, uh, one can show that when you glue, you just multiply elements of the Cartan group which you assigned by this isomorphism to the triangle. So you just multiply them, and so you don't lose the rationality, so to speak. And then you glue them all together, and you end up with something like that, which still has spinnings outside. So you can still keep gluing this, but inside, all spinnings are already gone. So you get something like that. And so this is, of course, a vibration with the fiber, in this case, H cube. But also because of the decomposition, it's evidently uh, produced irrational structure. So it's enough to have rational structure here, which is very easy thing to do, in order to inherit the rational structure of the whole thing. So in a sense, if you, for example, coordinate somehow this model space, you get some coordinates on the model space almost for free, so to speak. So I want to emphasize that in this definition, it comes almost for free. So it's just <coughs> built this way. But now let's see what it gives us for the simplest case, which is PGL2. So example. So let's say that G is a group PGL2. And so um, uh, as was evident from this example, the kind of the smallest building block uh, for those uh, uh, modular spaces is the one which related for the triangle. And so let's just draw a cartoon for the triangle. So PGT over the triangle for uh, the case of PGL2 parameterize the following data. So first of all, uh, we have, so first of all, we have local system, but there is none because it's triangle, it's trivial. Secondly, at the vertices, we have flags, which are just points of the projective space. And finally, as you can see from that uh, discussion on the blackboard on the right, the pinning in this case is just an extra line. So this means that you have some extra lines here. And so all together, let's call them uh, P, Q, and R. All together, you end up with six points on projective line. Again, they are very, they have different nature because those points, the white ones, they are just flags. And this point, they are pinning. They are objects of different nature. But for PGL2, they look on the same foot. And so this is birationally, as I just said. Uh, configuration space of six points on projective line. But then this implies that we have canonical coordinates. On this modular space PGT. Why? Because look, so if you look at this decomposition which I started from, then in this case, this is just a point. Nothing is going on. But H and H and H are three uh, copies of GM. And so this gives you three coordinates. But more specifically, <sighs> okay. 
Uh, more specifically, mm, uh, uh, to not define them, I want to introduce, first of all, cross-ratio of mm, uh, four points. And so how we define the cross-ratio? Actually, cross-ratio is a little confusing notion because there are several ways you can define it. And here only one is a good one. So we consider the lift, so we have these points which live on projective line. And we leave them to the vectors which lives in V2. And then we take, remember that you can take a volume form, omega, and so we can take volumes of those pairs of vectors and divide it this way. Volume of x2, x3 times volume of x4, x1. Actually, x1, x4. And now you notice, uh, I said tildes. Now you notice that this cross-ratio does not depend neither on choice of omega, nor on choice of these vectors, because we have each one vector downstairs, one upstairs. So that's a well-defined invariant. And also you notice that it's normalized by the cross-ratio of infinity minus 1, 0, and x to be x. All right, so now we can define the canonical coordinates. Uh, they're related to the sides of this triangle, and so the coordinate xr is just the cross-ratio of the point x1, x2, x3, r. The r is, is the one which comes from the pinning, and similarly, cyclically shifting this formula, you get the other coordinates, x2, x3, x1, q, uh, p, and xq is a cross-ratio of x3, x1, x2, and q. Okay, so uh, they are assigned to the sides of the triangle. So you clearly see it here that, for example, xr is assigned to this side, and so on. So what you do, you take the cross-ratio of these four points. All right, so that's what we do in the case uh, when we have a triangle, but the rest is already uh, basically forced on us, I would say almost forced. I mean, it is forced on us, we just have to calculate, that's why I say almost. So, gluing triangles, uh, we have the following picture, so we have to take two triangles like that, and we have to glue them according to the corresponding sides. So let's say that we have here two sides with spinnings P and Q. And let's say that the original data was points X1, X2, X3, and Y1, Y2, Y3. Uh, yeah, Y1, Y, let, let me make this Y2, Y3. Why? Because they follow, well, it doesn't actually matter that much. So we wanted to glue them. And so when we glue, uh, we have to impose conditions that P equals Q star. Q star is a non-trivial operation which you have to perform to actually glue them. And if you do it, uh, you get some number which is assigned to this edge. So here, first of all, we get four points, x1, x2, x3, I inherited, but this one so you identify x3 and y3 and x1 and y1, and then uh, you use the pinnings to make this identification unique. Uh, this means you have projective line here with two points and projective line here with two points. Uh, if you just want to identify this point with this and this with this, there is a star ambiguity, but because of the pinnings, there is a unique way to do this. 
This means that, for example, this point goes somewhere to the point x4 on the projective line we are talking about. Is now it's just one projective line, so to speak, which uh, we think about is assigned here. And we postulate, so we just said, that the new coordinate assigned uh, to, the vert to the edge is just a product uh, of the coordinates which we assign to this edge, red edge, and this red edge. So we just multiply them. So, uh, okay, I, I said it's postulate, but it's basically, once again, uh, we get some, some product, and uh, now there is a little statement about this product. This statement, uh, it's possible to define this a priori. It's a little claim. That this xe, which we defined as a product of the, of the coordinates which were sitting, uh, which were assigned to the red signs corresponding to pinnings, it's actually again a cross ratio of now x1, x2, x3, and x4. Those four points. And so that's it. So now we have defined a collection of functions uh, on the model space for PGL2 related to arbitrary decorated surface because now we can glue all the triangles together. So we take product of coordinates on the sides which we glue and all together we get some kind of uh, system of functions which correspond to the edges. And so the main claim here is that this is a rational coordinate system on this space which is basically obvious. Again, this is obvious from what I said before. Because from the gluing construction, it is obvious that this collection of functions is a collection of coordinates. You don't have to prove this. This is kind of given to you by the construction. So we proved the following theorem. That mm, uh, given an ideal triangulation, tau of a decorated surface S, uh, the functions we defined, the functions x sub e assigned to the edges of this triangulation uh, provide aberrational isomorphism. So it's a birational isomorphism from the model space PGL2S to the model space GM counted as many times as you have edges of this triangulation. By the way, I'm not sure I said before what is ideal triangulation. So ideal triangulation is a triangulation of your surface uh, which has uh, uh, vertices at the marked points. So if, if the collection of marked points is empty? Uh, as I said from the very beginning that it cannot be empty by default. Yes. Ideal triangulation means a triangulation uh, with vertices at the marked points. And marked points are both uh, punctures and special points. All right, so now we have... Uh, if your surface has some boundary, yes. including boundary... Edges. Yes, 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 including boundary. For example, the main example is a triangle. So where is this triangle on the blackboard? Yeah, here. So for this triangle, this model space is three-dimensional because it's basically six points on projective line. And these are the coordinates, as you can easily see. Remember that these points have to be generic. So this is precisely the coordinates, and actually unique coordinates on this set. But now the beautiful thing about this is that as soon as you understood what you do here, the rest is uh, forced on you by the construction. Yeah? In particular, the verdicts being puncture? Yes. For example, the surface can be just surface with one puncture. So, for example, you can have a punctured torus, which uh, on topological picture looks like that, 
and you present this like this. So this is ideal triangulation has two triangles. You of course glue the sides of the triangle, and so you have uh, ideal triangulation built from two triangles. But is it, is the fact that it's a function manifest itself in the data in any of the data? Yes, because the model space which I consider this is actually. Uh, a uh, beautiful question from Sergey. So the, the model space assigned from here, let's look. This is a model space of, first of all, uh, PGL2 local systems on the punctured torus. It's itself three dimensional. But we add some little extra data. We choose uh, for each punch, and there's only one punch. So we choose invariant flag. In this case, it's just invariant line, invariant under the monodromy. That's it. Now, in order to introduce coordinates, we cut the surface on two triangles. And so when we cut it out, we just get two triangles. And in order to handle this, we insist that we put the spinnings here. So we insist to consider a much bigger, at first glance, model space. Then it has coordinates. Now after you glue them, and so you glue all three pairs of sides here. After you glue, all the straight sides are gone. You don't see them in the answer. But, they, uh, but you inherited the coordinates from them. And so what happened here is that you, have, you basically had a uh, PGL2 local system on punctured torus. What you added to this picture was just a little data. You just added an invariant under the monodromy eigenline. So this is just basically two to one data. You can choose either this eigenline or that eigenline. But after you did this, uh, you can uh, localize this way. And this data, it's a data on a topologically trivial uh, space on the triangle. And so, in a sense, this tells you how you uh, reconstruct, uh, how you localize the topological notion of a local system on topological trivial objects, on triangles. And in order to do this, as usual, when we try to localize topological objects, so we have to introduce some extra data. And so, in this case, the extra data lives, of course, on the 2D part of our story, which is original local system. But it also lead, lives on 0D, zero-dimensional strata. This is our flags. And it also lives on one-dimensional strata. This is spinnings. So these three data, like L, beta, P in the definition of this model space, they tell you about the localization data on all 2D, 1D, and 3D and 0D dimensional uh, boundaries of the surface. And so that's how you localize topological notion. I emphasize again that after you localize on the triangles, you don't see local system at all. But you can recover it when you, when you glue back. And so that, that's... That's the point about this model space, that this is a model space which allows you to localize local systems. Uh, before we introduce the data uh, related to the sites, we were not able to do this. OK, but uh, as you remember, we wanted to have not just a model space with coordinates, we already have this, but we wanted to have a model space with a Poisson structure. So where is the Poisson structure? So. Mm, Uh, following these principles, in order to introduce the Poisson structure, you have to do it just once. You have to introduce this on the triangle. <coughs> so, we define a Poisson structure. on uh, this uh, elementary model space, PGT, uh, by the formulas, so using that blackboard notation, that xp xq uh, equals just xp multiplied xq. And this forces us, because we want to have cyclic symmetry, to have a similar definitions for the other Poisson brackets. And xr, xp is xr times xp. So there's nothing to check here. It's just a Poisson structure. And then we come to the second theorem. If that one was theorem A, this is theorem B, that there exists unique Poisson structure. Mm on this model space P, PGL2S uh, such that 
for any ideal uh, triangulation tau uh, of S, uh, the gluing map, which is a map from the product of P, PGL2 T, the modulus space assigned to the triangles, down to the modulus space we are looking for, P, PGL2 S, that this gluing map gamma is a Poisson map. Now, uh, if you think about this theorem, it's actually what you need to do is two things. So first of all, uh, this theorem is going to tell you what is, a po what is a Poisson brackets between the coordinates which we just introduced uh, before. We are going to calculate them in a second. And secondly, the theorem tells you that if you change the ideal triangulation, the Poisson structure is going to stay. Okay, so let's just start addressing this. So, uh, let me do it here. It's a Poisson structure. Then what is the dot? What, what is the right hand side? XP times XQ. It's it's a very good question, Sergio. Uh, you see that the orientation of the triangle is crucially involved in this definition. So we use the orientation to to tell you who is the first and who is the second in this Poisson bracket. If you change them to the opposite, you're going to pick up, of course, minus sign. So this is a product. Uh, it's a function, so functions can be multiplied. But in the case, symmetric thing. Uh, once again, so the order of p and q. Oh, I see. Okay. It would be right. Right. Yeah. star or two star or something. Huh? It's, this will involve changing the edge p to p star or something like. That. No, 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 no. It will be just a minus sign. So, by definition, x q, x p is going to be minus x p times x q. Or x q times x p. They're symmetric. So. This Poisson bracket is Q-symmetric, but in this formula, P is before Q. And P is before Q because that's how they look on the picture. So on the picture, it seems that we're talking about counterclockwise orientation of the... We, we're going about surface having counterclockwise orientation. This is actually quite an annoying thing because on the pictures you have to uh, tell yourself which orientation you, you take, clockwise or, or counterclockwise. You say you have orientation of the surface, but how you depict on the pictures. You have to decide. And then concrete formulas, concrete pictures will depend on this. But the definition is, is okay. Okay, let me do it here. So we define uh, a skew symmetric uh, function. Mm, epsilon ij of pairs of edges of tau uh, uses the following recipe. So we say that this epsilon ij, the Poisson tensor, is given by the sum uh, over all possible triangles uh, with the following properties. So first of all, what we sum is such gadget, which I'm going to define in a second. It has value 0, minus 1, or plus 1. And t is just some uh, triangulation, is some triangle of your triangulation. And now the key thing is how you define this gadget. I and j are edges. Huh? I and j are edges. Yes, that's a good point. I, j are edges of tau. And so uh, by definition, the symbol I, t, j, is going to be, let me put it this way, I, T, J. It can have three possibilities, plus one, minus one, or zero. Plus one if this triangle T uh, uh, is such that I and J are the, its sides and they go this way. This case means counterclockwise. So 
if they go the opposite way, you put the minus sign, and otherwise you put zero. So this implies that my epsilon ij uh, could be any number between zero and uh, plus minus one and plus minus two, or plus minus plus minus one plus minus two or zero. So it could have five values. Uh, for example, uh, if you take a puncture torus, then you have just three sides: one, two, and three. And so if you calculate epsilon 1, 2, for example, uh, it is by cyclic symmetry is going to be the same as epsilon 2, 3 and as epsilon 3, 1. And this is 2. It's not 1. So why 2? Because uh, when you do the calculation, you have to think about uh, this pair and uh, also this pair. So somehow, uh, uh, the contribution between the Poisson bracket between 1 and 2 comes from this angle and this angle. So the two contributions is plus 2. Okay, now of course uh, the claim is, as you can imagine, the claim is that if you calculate uh, the Poisson brackets by the rule I just explained, the rule means there are two rules here. So the main rule is that you have Poisson bracket on the triangle, and then you glue all these triangles together. So you multiply coordinates on the edges, and so you get some coordinates on the product, which turns out to be cross ratios. And then uh, to calculate the Poisson bracket between those cross ratios, you basically have to write them down as a product of this uh, original uh, coordinates, initial coordinates, and use the Poisson brackets between initial coordinates, assuming that the Poisson brackets on two different triangles do not talk to each other. They, they give you zero. So if you calculate it this way, you get the following answer. This is what we expected. This is epsilon ij, xi, xj. So this claim tells us that this epsilon tensor is the Poisson tensor for this Poisson structure. Okay, so this is calculation for one particular uh, coordinate system. So the question is, uh, what do we do uh, if we have different coordinate system? In this case, we of course need to change the triangulation. And it's known that any two triangulations can be changed by a sequence of elementary transformations called flips, essentially any two. So there is some kind of supply of triangulations which you use here, and any two of them re related by flips. But uh, mm, uh, before we do this, so I said we have a flip of triangulation. So, and the rest of the triangulation changes. So, we wanted to ask the question how the epsilon function changes under a flip at and edge k. And the answer is the following. So if you do the flip, you get a new Poisson tensor. And this new Poisson tensor is expressed uh, via the old ones using the foreign falling formula. It's minus epsilon ij if the edge where you made the flip, we called k here, is one of the i or j. And if not, it is epsilon ij plus one half of the falling product. So we take epsilon ik times epsilon kj plus epsilon ik times epsilon kj. So why would I write one half of this? Uh, because I want to put absolute values. So that's how it changes. And OK, so this is the result of, of, of uh, calculations that whatever uh, situation you had, you have the following formula for the epsilon function. And then the next question is how uh, the coordinates change. Under a flip. 
at k. And the answer is the following. Sasha, do I understand correctly that in this form kind of from the i could be an internal edge or a boundary? Yes, 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 yes. There is no difference between uh, in this formula internal or external edges, yes. Which is uh, kind of clear from the main formula for the triangle. So if you look at the triangle and look how we introduce Poisson brackets, yeah. we exactly obey this rule. So how we change the Poisson structure, this is the last thing I'm going to tell you before the break. So if you start with original triangulation and had some coordinates here like x, a, b, c, and d, then you're going to end up is a flip triangulation, and the coordinates here will be x inverse, and then goes some formulas which look a little strange, if not ugly. A b times 1 plus x inverse inverse, and d times 1 plus x inverse inverse, and here's a times 1 plus x. So this is the result of straightforward calculation, and you can check the Poisson bracket is preserved. So this means that the theorem is proved. So you recalculate the coordinates, they satisfy Poisson bracket. And the only thing which somehow desires to be understood better is the following, that, that up to this point, everything looks actually extremely nice and kind of canonical. So with this idea of introducing the boundary data, so the whole definition of coordinates in the Poisson bracket bec become completely straightforward and kind of forced on us by the original step. But this is a little strange. So I mean, these formulas do not look nice. So we are going to see after the break, that actually they, they do look nice, but you have to understood them uh, in a more sophisticated way. So you have to make this, you have to go to the quantum world, then the formulas become very nice. And then when you go down to the classical uh, world and do the calculation, then you get what you get. So actually the whole story is nice. Uh, and both formulas on the right-hand side of the blackboard are actually uh, consequences of some more fundamental and nicer formulas. But we are going to see this after the break. So the break is t up to uh, 15.40, so let's say like seven minutes. So let's continue. So we have this coordinate change given on the blackboard. And there are some comments about these formulas. Uh, the first comment that these formulas star, they involve uh, the addition, multiplication, division, but not subtraction. And this means that uh, they make sense for any semi-field. Okay. I remind you that semi-field is a set where you have the three operation plus, multiply, and define, divide. And so uh, this implies, let me go to a different part of the blackboard. This implies that for any uh, semi-field K, we can define a set Uh, P, P, G, L, 2, S, with values in this semi-field. So this is something we cannot do in usual algebraic geometry, but we can do in this situation, because what you do, just declare that uh, in one coordinate system, a point of your guy is just any collection of elements of K assigned to the edges of triangulation. And then you just recalculate how these coordinates change by using those formulas. And because they on the nose satisfies the pentagon relation, which is obvious from the construction. You don't have to check anything. Uh, the corresponding point, uh, now you know how the corresponding coordinates, how the coordinates of this uh, perspective point will look in any coordinate system. So you define a point with values uh, in this semi-field. Uh, at this moment, we don't say anything else, but just we can define the set. Uh, but also the second comment is, that uh, the action 
of the mapping class group uh, is explicit in these coordinates, which is obvious. And uh, this implies that this mapping class group acts on the set of k points, digital to s k points, that we have the action of the mapping class group. Now, let me explain actually what this means and how this works. So, if you start with some triangulation of a surface, if you apply the element of the mapping class group, then we get some hugely distorted triangulation of the surface and so and going on. But uh, so these tri two triangulations can be uh, related by flips. So we can write a sequence of flips which relates this one to this one. And so what happens, you notice that coordinates of the, if you're talking about usual local system, for example, coordinates of the pullback local system uh, with respect to uh, coordinate system obtained by pulling back the triangulation. So they are by definition the same thing as coordinates of L with respect to, to tau. This is tautology. Because when you pull the, when you move the triangulation and move the local system, nothing, nothing happens. However, uh, what you really want to do, you want to express uh, the coordinates of the moved local systems in the coordinate system related to tau. And this way you get some complicated subtraction fee free uh, expression because it involves uh, some sequence of flips. And that's how the mapping class group acts on local system and therefore on uh, any uh, k-valid points of this model space. Okay? All right. The next question is uh, what actually we get from this? Joel asked me a question in the, during the break. So what's going on for general G? And for general G, the point is that uh, the same thing is going on. It's the same format. And therefore, it's a good idea to see what actually we get. So we get some explicit collection of coordinate systems. There are infinitely many of them. The mapping class group acts on them. That's why infinitely many of them. Uh, Modulus the action of the mapping class group, actually, we still have finitely many of them. But the total number is infinite. We have formulas which allow us to recalculate what's going on. And uh, the new thing which happened here is that this formula uh, makes sense for any semi-field. So let's play with this. What kind of semi-fields we have? Uh, the first example, of course, the semi-field of positive numbers. This is a tautological example. You add them, multiply, divide, but should not subtract. The second is the semi-field of tropical numbers, which is defined as a set as a set R, with a three operation plus multiply and divide, uh, given as max uh, plus and subtract. And then you can restrict to the subsets. You can restrict to the subset of, tropi of tropical rational points and tropical integer points. And obviously, those operations preserve the subsets. So we have more semi-fields. But there's one more semi-field, r bigger than 0 of epsilon, which is just uh, given as Laurent series like that. So we have a n epsilon to n plus a n plus 1 epsilon n plus 1 plus and so on up to infinity. And you insist that this coefficient and only this coefficient is bigger than 0. Then again, you obviously can multiply and divide them. And you also can add them up. You will never get negative sign when you add them up. So it's semi-field again. And now this semi-field is intuitively clear. This is also intuitively clear. And those are explained through this one because there is a map Uh, which takes uh, 
Laurent series with a positive leading coefficient just to tropical num integers. And what it does, it takes the Laurent series like that just to number n. I have to actually, if I take maximums minus n, I choose, I, I could take minimum here, still will be semi-filled, but I prefer to take maximum, then I have to put minus n. The point is, is that when you add two power series and you look at the uh, leading coefficient, it can get smaller. Uh, I mean, so uh, if, if I don't put here minus, if I just put n, then it can get smaller. So if you take minimum, you catch it. And so if you change uh, the sign, you, get, you have to put maximum. Now, this explains where does the semi fields come from. They are just images, homomorphic images of this one. And so basically, this is a major one, and this is somehow the uh, descendants of the semi field. So all semi fields are natural. But then there is a question so what do we get? So the question is who are uh, those sets? GL2 S of K. So can we interpret them in a meaningful way? And of course the first question is what we get when the semi-field is semi-field of positive numbers. And in this case the answer, the theorem, that if you take this model space P, P GL2 S with coefficients in R plus, then uh, what we get is the extended, and I will define this in a second, attack Muller space tau s. Now I have to define the right hand side. It's some little enlargement of the attack Muller space. So it works as follows. So I hope you remember the definition of the usual tech Miller space, which was given in the previous lecture. And then to get the point of the extended one, you just need to get a little bit of data. Uh, so definition. The extended tech Miller space. Now S parameterize uh, pairs uh, which consist of a point of the usual technical space plus uh, an eigenvalue of the monodromy. Let's call this eigenvalue lambda p. Monodromy mm. around each uh, puncture P. So <coughs> basically, we add for every point, we add two or possibly one, if it's unipot monodromy, uh, bits of data. But now, what's nice about the extended technical space is. Uh, that's a claim which actually consequence of that theorem if you want it. Uh, this extended Techmiller space is diffeomorphic to R to uh, the number of edges of any particular triangulation. And in particular, it's R, I, diffeomorphic to R to N. Remember that the usual Techmiller space, which sits here, uh, is a manifold with corners. So it looks like that. And if you go to this one, the corners are gone. You just have plain Rn. So um, why this is a consequence of the previous theorem? Because basically, by the definition I gave you, the R positive points uh, are going to be isomorphic to R plus raised to power n when there's a number of edges. Because you just take one coordinate system and prescribe positive number to the edges. Uh, that's it, you, might, you can say. But this doesn't yet prove. Uh, the theorem because it just says that the left hand side is R to N. 
but how you identify the left hand side and the right hand side. So let me just give you, I'm not going to prove the whole theory, but I'm just going to give you a map from the extended tacmular space to the set of positive points uh, of this model space. And so, uh, first of all, you of course pick at an ideal triangulation tau. And then uh, you see the following picture that uh, if you start with your ideal triangulation, then it looks something like that. So you have some points, let's say P1, P2, P3, P4, and you can consider the quadrangle related for example, to one of the chosen diagonals E. Now you're going back to the universal cover. This is the universal cover, so it's an upper half plane. And when you go to the universal cover, uh, it, remember that you have what, uh, it looks like punctures here, but actually if you go to universal cover, remember that the Miller space looks as follows. You have this next here, ge minimal geodesics. And they will develop to geodesics like that. And this foregone will be lifted to the ideal foregone, which looks like that. Uh, and so we have this point, this, this, and this, like that. That's how you leave this foregone. But notice one uh, thing, that when you leave this foregone, I choose this uh, red point here, but I may also choose this one. So that depends which eigenvalue I take. Because these two points, this one and this one, on the projective real line, they are just this projective real line at the same time as a kind of accident, PGL2 accident here. This is also RP1, which is a flag variety for PGL2. This is a kind of a classical accident here. And so now we treat this line not as a boundary of the uh, Lobachevsky hyperbolic plane, but as a flag variety. And this, these two points, uh, you can think about them as just eigenlines of the monodromy. But remember that we have to choose one, and so we choose one everywhere, and then if you do it, then this uh, picture lifts this way. Okay? So now after it lifts this way, obviously, so you get here some points, let me call them P1 tilde, P2 tilde, P3 tilde, and P4 tilde, and if you want to leave this uh, edge, the edge going to be lived this way. But the key point is, <coughs> uh, is the following remark, which is a separate remark, that for any points uh, on a circle, let's call them x1, x2, x3, x4, the cross ratio of these points is positive if and only if uh, cyclic order of the points agrees uh, with the cyclic order on S1. And so here, by construction, uh, you have a lift of the ideal foregone, so the cyclic order of the points <coughs> is going to follow the order on the line. And so this implies, this remark implies, that the corresponding coordinate, xe, is bigger than zero. That's all we need. So we produced a map which takes a point of the extended technical space and creates a bunch of numbers, which it turns out to be by this little comment, positive numbers related to the edges. This is a map from here to here, because this set is understood at the moment as a collection of positive numbers assigned to one particular triangulation. So that's it, we get the map. Then it's easy to prove that this map is one to one. I'm not going to do this. So the conclusion is that this structure is such that R plus points give you Teichmiller space. How about the tropical points? So now the natural class of points. And so mm, I'll give you just these two examples because the whole goal of this lecture is not uh, education in Tachmiller's theory, but applications to representation theory. 
And these two examples are of crucial importance for representation theory, as you'll see a little later on. So that's why we're talking for so long about them. So especially this one. So if you take the tropical uh, set to be the, the tropical, this, sorry, the semi-field to be the semi-field of rational tropical numbers, then uh, what we get is another theorem that if you take this uh, model space P, PGL2S and evaluate this at the Q tropical points, then the set you get, the not kind of notation of this guy is this one, but this is by definition uh, the set of rational uh, uh, x or sometimes we say unbounded jargon laminations on S. Now, as before, I need to define this, the, the, the very notion of a rational lamination or unbounded lamination. But then that's what we get as a result, that after I define this notion, it's defined entirely geometrically. The result is that this geometric definition of the set delivers you the tropical, uh, Q tropical point of this modulus space. Now, what the definition is? This definition, the very notion of lamination is due to Thurston. And there's some variance on this. And so definition is a little long. So a rational uh, x lamination. So it's a little long definition. So I, I prefer to give you a picture of this definition first. And then I'll just explain what you see on this picture. So the picture is that you start with a surface, which looks like that. And it may happen that the surface has some boundary component. And on the boundary component, you necessarily have some number of points, at least one. These are those points. And then this lamination is just a collection of non-intersective curves. But these curves could be loops, so they can go, for example, this way. Uh, and they can have multiplicities, which are rational numbers. So it could be, for example, three tenths here. Or it can have loop like that. And it could be like uh, five here. Uh, mm, the numbers are positive. And you can have, for example, an arc which going from cusp to here. Or it can go from cusp to here. Or it can go. Uh, between the cusps like this, or any other way you can imagine here. But they do not intersect, that's the main point. So the point is that we may or may not have some red curves which go to every cusp or to every boundary segment. Uh, so we may not have any of them, but uh, uh, if you have them, they come with weights, for example, like three here and one tenth here or whatever. And the main point is that they do not intersect. And also, if you see two uh, loops which are isotopic to each other, you can just join them and add up the weights. So that's the definition in the words. So if you want me to write them down uh, as a long set of words, this is the following one. So this is homotopy classes. Come to class a single elimination. Mm. Uh, of a collection uh, of uh, a finite number of non self intersecting and pairwise non-intersecting, this is the conditions that they do not intersect, curves on S uh, with multiplicities in the set of ra positive rational numbers, positive rational numbers. Uh, and these curves can be either 
uh, closed or ending at, uh, so they're either closed or ending at cusps uh, or, oh, sorry, boundary intervals. That's long, long, long story. And in the end of the day, I just need one more condition, which is important condition, that besides all this, I have to choose some orientations of the punches which support the curve, plus uh, orientations, plus or minus, of the punches supporting the curves. OK, so on the picture, I did not put yet this data, just waiting till we get here. So now I can put this data, so I have to put somewhere I put plus, somewhere I put minus, for example, plus, minus, minus, and here I put nothing. So this puncher, there's nothing because there's no curves there. Okay, so that's the notion of the lamination, and then the claim is that the set of these laminations equipped with positive weights is nothing else but the set of QT tropical points of the same modal space. Why this is so? So, as again, I'm going to give you a construction one way. So I'm going to tell you how you produce numbers if you have this lamination. And till I'm, erasing, till I'm raising, I'm just going to say that this will play a crucial role in implications to representation theory because this gives you a, the simplest example of this canonical basis, kind of new kind of canonical basis uh, in algebraic geometry, in particular in kind of related to representation theory, which go beyond Lustig's uh, canonical basis. So this, this gives you the simplest possible example of this, and the kind of the first example of this kind of basis. And so it turns out that this basis will be parameterized not by rational, but the, by integral laminations of this type. Integral means that the weight supposed to will be integers, not rational numbers. So that's why I care so much about them, because this is a set which will appear as a set which, par which parameterizes some linear basis on some other dual modulus space, which we'll talk about a little later on. But now let me give you coordinatization. So this is a map from the set of laminations on S Q to uh, P, P, G, L, 2, S uh, with values in this tropical semi-field. <coughs> so as usual, we pick an ideal triangulation tau. Uh, and then uh, what we do is the following. So let's suppose that we have some puncher and then we have some collection of curves which ended this puncture. So, like this one and this one. And so, first of all, this puncture has attached to the sign, plus or minus. Remember that. And depending on the sign, we'll rotate infinitely many times this curves to one way or the other way. If plus following the orientation, if minus uh, following the opposite orientation of the surface. And so, this will give us. Uh, the following picture. So let's say we have here plus. Then we kind of rotate it infinitely many times like this. But we also have to do the same with the other curve. And so with the other curve, let me do it in a slightly different color. So it goes this way. Eh. Where, where is the triangulation in that picture? Uh, triangulation at this moment didn't appear yet. It's not important. Wait a second. So this is just a pre-procedure. So uh, we rotate in this is that way. This is the first step. The second step is that if we, as Joel said, have a triangulation, 
Then we are going to assign the number to the triangulation. And then we count. So what we count, we, count, we count the curves which come this way or the other way. And we do not count the curves which go this way. This curves we don't count. We count only the curves which intersect the diagonal. And then we count these ones with a sign plus, and these ones with a sign minus. You can ask me, what does this one mean? So that's a good exercise for you. So this picture, together with the orientation of the surface, tells uniquely what uh, the word this one means. So you can distinguish between red and uh, kind of little orange here. And so one is with a plus, the other with a minus. It does not depend. You look from here and from there. And after that, you just take the sum of all the weights. And then for each edge, E uh, takes the sum uh, of the weights uh, if they are positive and subtract the sum of the weights if they are kind of with negative sign. But all weights originally are positive numbers. You remember that. But when you count them, you count them with plus and minus. And so in the end of the day, the numbers you get, you get arbitrary numbers, positive and negative. And so this, the statement is that this map is an isomorphism. In particular, you can check that if you do the flip, and this is kind of fun statement here. The main point is that under flip, uh, if you have happen to have such picture you have x0 here and x1, x2, x3, x4. And you go to this one, which minus x0. And here you get something like x3 plus maximum of x0, 0. Here you get x2 minus maximum of x0, 0 is a minus. And the same formulas here and here. So that's how the coordinates which we just introduced work under the flip. And then if you compare them with those formulas, you clearly see that these formulas are obtained by tropicalization of the, those ones. And so that's exactly the claim that we get not just assignment which assigns to elimination collection of rational numbers, but assignment which assigns to elimination a point of a variety with this positive structure with values in tropical points. This just means that under the flips, they uh, work the same way as the tropicalized coordinates there. OK, so that's it about the elementary geometry and uh, of classical geometry of this modular spaces. Yes? So how does the picture one and picture two uh, relate to each other? You have a curve that's got located there. Uh, you see, uh, when you have a triangulation, you have to count how many times this curves intersect the triangulation. Yeah, so in the main times you rotate. I just think about this. So you take them with a plus and minus, and so eventually they will cancel out. If you you, you take, <laughs> so so I'm saying that the numbers here will be uh, so. Uh, mm, mm, Should be all right. So I beg you. I don't. I want to 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 argue why it's so. But you'll get a finite number. Let's not uh, uh, try to to dig into this. And if if I will have to have correction, I'll do it next time. But <coughs> all right. So I didn't want to speak that much about this particular subject. So it's important for us for the for the following reasons. So now we are going to say that we have uh, a similar structure when you have arbitrary group G. And so the output of this is that if we do have such a similar structure with some kind of strange coordinate change and so on, which will be explained in a minute, then we do have the corresponding notions. Then we do have the notion of the Tachmiller space just takes the positive points, and the space of laminations just takes the tropical points. And then we will play with the spaces. So now let's go to a different subject. And we'll try to explain those original formulas because uh, remember that uh, uh, we wanted to explain where all those formulas come from. And so the subject which we're going to take to talk right now is the notion of a cluster Poisson uh, varieties. 
and their uh, quantization. This follows our work with Volodya Fock in 2003. And this was an attempt to uh, somehow to, to, to explain what kind of uh, structure we get when we consider a similar, so we considered a similar coordination for PGLM local systems and got some kind of uh, exchange, some kind of transition formulas. So we wanted to, to present this in a kind of setup and then we realized that the setup is going, uh, is going to use in a certain way uh, the cluster algebras of Fomin and Zelewinsky, but it's actually going to be a different, the dual story. So it's dual to Fomin and Zelewinsky cluster algebras. Uh, you will see the, the word dual is, has lots of meaning here, and you will see in what sense dual, it's uh, very important later. But let's first talk about this notion Mm, so first of all, uh, let me remind you what is a quiver. So re remember that uh, when we define coordinates, uh, we assign them to the edges, and then we use this epsilon exchange matrix, this epsilon Poisson tensor, uh, of course, between the pairs of edges. Now here is a way to do this in a kind of abstract form. We said that the quiver C uh, is a datum. which is given by the lattice lambda, uh, form a collection of basis vectors and a sub-collection there, and collection of so-called skew-symmetrizers. So here is uh, what we have here. So first of all, this lambda is a lattice. Secondly, uh, this EI uh, is a basis of lambda and it has a subset which we called EF uh, is called subset of frozen uh, basis vectors. And uh, mm, mm, uh, the second piece of data here is that we have this bilinear form. Uh, but this bilinear form with values in half integers. Half integer valued uh, bilinear form. on this lattice. Uh, and the main condition is that uh, the value of this form on the basis vectors is actually integer unless uh, both i and j are frozen. That's very, very important. Frozen means uh, they belong to the frozen part of the basis. Now, the third part of this data uh, is uh, that the skew symmetrizers, they are positive integers, uh, multipliers, skew symmetrizers, whatever. So, and the condition is that if you take a new bilinear form, which is given as the old one, multiplied by dj inverse here, then with this one is skew symmetric. Okay? And so this is just a quiver, or as some people say, weighted quiver, because what is a quiver? Oriented quiver, I mean. So this means that you have some vertices, and this vertices is just the basis vectors. Then from one vertex to the other, you have some number of arrows, and this number of arrows is given by the value of this form, epsilon ij. 
and this form is uh, it is bilinear, but it's almost Q-symmetric because if you multiply this form by a positive number, it becomes Q-symmetric. This means that at least if you change EI, EJ to EJ to EI, it changes the sign. So there is only one direction between them, which is a positive direction, and that's the direction where you put the arrows. But then there are some vectors, uh, some basis vectors, which are frozen, and then the number of arrows from them could be half integral. So we draw this like half dotted arrows. So these are the frozen variables. And then you can put some integers, which is skew-symmetrizers or multipliers, d2, d3, and so on. So that's the weighted quiver on the picture, and that's the weighted quiver in a formal way. It's exactly the same thing. Now, what we can do with the quiver, we can do quiver mutation. The second definition. And uh, uh, the mutations are done in the direction k. Who is this k? So this set of, I can say not k, I just say, can say ek. But it's customary just to parameterize the basis vectors by a certain set i. And then you can just say direction, mutation is direction k. So, okay. So this is mutation mu e k, which takes quiver c and produce out of this a new quiver c prime. So who is a quiver c prime? Uh, first of all, I insist here that this e k is non-frozen. You will see why in a second. We can mutate only in non-frozen directions. And then this C prime, new quiver, it has same, almost same date, it has same lattice, it has the same bilinear form, it has the same set of multipliers, the so skew symmetrizers. So you may ask what actually is different. So the only one thing is different, that the basis, the new basis is different and it's given by the following symbol formula, by half reflection. So the new basis, the mutated basis, is old one plus EI EK plus. Plus means that it's zero if it's negative and the number which you see here if it's positive, multiplied by EK. This is if I is not equal to K, and it's minus EK uh, if I equals to K. So that's it. This is the only formula which is relevant to the whole story. The only kind of new formula we add. Now, uh, how it relates, uh, first of all, the first thing you notice that if you do mutation twice, if you do, let's call it mu k, not mu k. If you do mu k and then mu k, mutation with the same vector, then uh, if you apply it to EI, so this is your EI double prime. This is actually EI plus scalar product EI EK, EK. And so it's a different basis. So it's not true that if you do mutation of basis twice, you get the same basis. It's twice in the same direction, you get the same basis. It's a different basis. But nevertheless, but if you take the value of your form on this new basis vectors, it is the same as it was before. This means that the square of the mutation at the same direction is actually a kind of uh, it's a transformation which preserves this bilinear form. Okay, the next thing uh, we wanted to say parallel to this then we can introduce the exchange matrix.
uh, let's call it epsilon ij, which is by definition is just the value of the form on e i and j. Uh, and then you also have this multipliers. So you have this data, and this data, uh, you can ask how this data behaves under the mutation. And then the formula is precisely that formula which you have here. This mutation in the direction k is given by the formula which we had here. So remember that this formula was written in a very specific setup of the setup of the triangulation, but the formula itself works for arbitrary mutation of quivers if you understand mutation this way. And so this is kind of simpler than writing down this, this formula for mutation of the exchange matrix. Now, uh, the history of this formula is the following. So this formula is the Fomin Zelevinsky mutation formula. Uh, for the exchange matrix. This, the only difference is that they denoted by Bij, not epsilon ij. But there is essential difference, which looks like a little difference, but actually very essential, that uh, in the Fomin Zelevinsky have no values epsilon f1, f2 if f1, f2 are frozen. This is the same setup, but uh, there is no values between the frozen variables. Okay. But in yours there is. Hmm? But in yours there is. Yes. And you notice that if we, that in this formula, if you mutate in the uh, in the unfrozen direction, this is still an integer, and therefore it takes a basis of the lattice to a basis of the lattice. If you apply formula for, if you take mutation with unfrozen with a frozen uh, k, and this will be frozen. This is half integer, so strictly speaking, you are already out of the lattice. You can say, all right, big deal, you're out of the lattice, but you will see that it actually leads to uh, to problems later on. So <laughs> you see it a little later on. So, so there is no, uh, the, the epsilon matrix like rectangular matrix and ours and big and square matrix. And also it's very interesting to note, so this for me, Zelevinsky, this is about 2000, I think that I discovered like in 2000. And also the same formula is discovered by Nathan Zyberg in 95. Uh, Zyberg is a physicist, of course, in a different, uh, in a completely different setup. But it was exactly the same uh, setup that you have quivers and you mutate quivers. So he mutated quivers for, for different reasons and that is the same formula. So it's very interesting, well, actually, eventually to see why these two subjects go in, in the same direction, but we are not going to talk about this. All right. So now we kind of, we get this formula on the blackboard now and it's kind of explained by the mutation formula for the basis vectors, which looks kind of a little simpler. Now, the last challenge which we have, we want to explain this formula. And in order to do this, as I said, we're supposed to go to the quantum world. So we have to quantize the story. So if you start with quiver C, then first of all, we can assign to this uh, the cluster Poisson torus uh, T sub C, uh, which is just home from the lattice lambda to GM. 
basically the game we are playing now we want to get to recover as much as we can from this PGL2 story or Teichmuller story in the setup of arbitrary quiver. So basically we're saying that we start from arbitrary quiver rather than from triangulation, but we are going to get the same notions as, as, as we like and we have for, for the, let's say, for the classical Teichmuller theory. So the question is how far we can go. And actually we want to get more, we want to get the quantum version. So the quantum, so first of all, this is a Poisson torus, but how to explain this Poisson torus? Because first of all, it gives rise to quantum torus. Uh, which we denoted by, as in the first lecture, OQ of TC. And uh, it has linear generators over ZQQ inverse X lambda, where this lambda and then mu corresponds to L vectors of the lattice. And the multiplication rule, as we discuss, uh, this is Q to uh, bilinear form lambda mu with coefficient 2 on X lambda plus mu. But now it's completely defined in our setup because we have this Q-symmetric form uh, in the game. Uh, you see it there. And so we can define the quantum torus algebra. Now we can define the quantum mutation. Mm. So uh, we can uh, quantize, we can define immediately the quantum mutation in the direction of any uh, unfrozen base vector. And it's done as follows. The Poisson structure is also given by uh, Poisson, if you said quantum, you already got Poisson by quasi-classical limit. Yes. So the main definition is that quantum mutation uh, at uh, EK. And when I say EK, this means that it always comes, uh, so you have some uh, here quiver C, and here you have quiver C prime. And so mutation goes this way and has label here. So this is the data which gives you the mutation, but this mutation is a vector EK, is by definition an isomorphism of non-commutative fraction fields so it's phi corresponding to mutation which takes us from C to C prime in the direction K and this is a map from the fraction field of OQ of T C prime to isomorphically to fraction field of OQ of T C. And is defined as follows. So this is uh, It's given by the following operation. So this is just a conjugation by some power series, which is called the quantum dialogic power series, evaluated at the variable x e k. Remember that every basis vector produces an element in your quantum torus algebra, whose psi I'll tell in a, in a second. But this has to be precomposed with certain isomorphism from C to C prime. So now I need to define uh, both gadgets here, but this is a formula. That's how the quantum mutation works. Now, who is who here? First of all, uh, this i from c to c prime, it's just an isomorphism from uh, t c prime to c t c. This is just stories. Uh, you, can say, you, you can say this is isomorphism from the corresponding quantum torus algebras, which works in a very simple way. So the generator which corresponds to xei prime goes to the generator xei. 
this EI prime is a new basis which is obtained by mutation. And so basically this is the isomorphism which takes mutated lattice to the original lattice. It's a very simple monomial transformation. Now, psi is more interesting. So psi q of x is expression which is known from 19th century and it's called the Pochhammer symbol. Uh, the only difference slightly is that I want to take the inverse of that. And so now we call it the uh, quantum uh, dialog written uh, power series. Uh, and so what we do, we take the conjugation uh, in our uh, quantum torus algebra by using this infinite power series. So it's like in aptomorphism, but not quite in aptomorphism because it's not given by element of your algebra, it's given by element of some extended algebra. And so the main, uh, say, key observation. So what's the meaning of add? Add means conjugation, adjoint. This means that, uh, I'll write you in a second. So, okay, so let me, since you asked, so I'm about to finish today. Huh? So the transformation is the following one. So if you wanted to know what happens with a vector, with a element of your quantum torus algebra, why? What you do, first of all, you apply your monomial transformation from C to C prime to this vector Y, and you get a new element of uh, quantum torus algebra related to the same lattice. So it's basically the same uh, quantum torus algebra, just with a different basis as a label, okay? But then you do something highly non-trivial. You take this infinite power series, psi q of x e k, and you conjugate this guy uh, with this infinite power series. So this is z, the, the thing. So you consider this transformation. And a priori, this transformation doesn't make any sense because it looks like it takes you to the world of infinite power series. But the main observation is that actually this transformation is rational, is a, is a birational isomorphism. This is a key fact. And I'll give you an example, I'm already going over time what I'm supposed to do today. I'll give you an uh, example next time. But the key point is that this is a rational transformation. And then if you apply this uh, transformation in the case of the lattice you're talking about, you'll get exactly the formula star. So the last claim that uh, not only that it's rational, it's you can compute it and see what it is. We'll do it next time. And so the claim that in the quasi-classical uh, limit, when you do first the transformation quantum case, and then you set q equal to 1, the classical, list, classical limit is when q limits to 1. But what you do, you first do it when q is generic, you get some formula, and then you specialize this formula and q equals to 1, and then you get Get precisely the formula star uh, for uh, if you started uh, with uh, ideal triangulation quiver. If you're starting with some other quiver, you'll get some similar formula, which looks a little bit more complicated, which I'll be uh, talk about uh, next, I'll give you this formula next time. But it's very similar to this formula. Actually, maybe as a last step, I'll just give you this formula. Uh, and that's the last thing I wanted to do today. Mm. Yeah. So the formula you get is that x i prime equals its x i inverse if i equals to k, it x i times 1 plus x k uh, mm, to epsilon chi a 
if epsilon k a is bigger than zero and x i times one plus x k inverse epsilon k a is epsilon k a is less than or equal to zero. And actually I know that what I'm telling you is a little, little lie because you have to change from epsilon to minus epsilon to get this simple formula. There is a little, uh, in, the, in the setup which I was giving you, the correct formula will be obtained by ch changing epsilon to minus epsilon, but it doesn't, doesn't change too much in the story. So you get this kind of formulas which are very similar to the one uh, which you have on the blackboard. But again, the main point is that it, it, these formulas look kind of ugly. It's, it's, it's very strange, but if you go to the quantum world, then you see that actually they are very simple and beautiful because this is just a conjugation by one function. And this function is universal. You always conjugate by one function. And all these contributions, apps and so on, this is just a calculation how you do this conjugation in quantum torus. But it's not really a part of the definition because the definition is much simpler. And so you kind of see the beauty of these transformations only when you go quantum and you don't see it on the classical level. It looks a little, little strange. So uh, that's basically it. So what you want to say now, uh, we say that, okay, we have collection of quantum tori and we have them for every quiver. And then what we do, we take one quiver, then we mutate in all possible directions. We take all other, this uh, 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 quantum torus algebra, the fraction fields, then mutate again in all possible non-frozable directions. And then we get many, many fraction fields and we identify them in these birational transformations. And then what we get is the kind of field of functions on this cluster variety, which we're going to talk about. But we need actually more. We, we want to talk not about the field of functions. We want to talk about the ring of functions. And I'll tell you uh, next time how to do this. But basically, the output is that we will recover uh, what we had before as the algebra of regular functions on this modular space PGS now is recovered by this general construction in a very general setup when you start with arbitrary, uh, with arbitrary quiver. And it actually comes not as a alge usual algebra of functions, it comes as a Q-deformed algebra of functions. Okay, so next time is Monday. How does this formula related to the usual Fomin-Zelevinsky? There is no Fomin-Zelevinsky here because the usual Fomin-Zelevinsky story is a dual story. And uh, it's actually not quite, you can't quite obtain it immediately this way. So you can, you can eventually uh, get to cluster algebra's formulas in, in this setup, but, but not immediately and not exactly. So the, this, the point is that you have this cluster algebra, so you can take this spectrum. This is some variety. You have this cluster Poisson variety, and it's also some other variety. So this one has Poisson structure. This one has a different dual structure. It has two form. So this one is canonically quantized. Canonically means that all constructions are all quantization construction invariant and all symmetries of the, of the problem. This one actually is not quite, uh, it's not possible to quantize it symmetrically because it's possible to quantize in many different ways. Uh, and Bernstein Zelewinski did this then, but then you lose the, the symmetry of the problem. So because there, is, there are many quantizations, the kind of symmetry group of the problem, it moves them. And so there is none which is actually preserved. And it shouldn't be one because this is a, there's no post structure in the space canonically. Again, so it's, uh, there are many of them. Okay, so uh, because this story is quantum, canonically quantum, so you can define this transformation formulas using the quantum torus. And if you want to do this to the other one, then you have to adjust your tools a little bit. Basically, you have to invoke, you, you have to consider a bigger space, which is also Poisson, and uh, get the cluster algebra story as by some specialization. <laughs>